Good afternoon. I'm Professor Rod Ruoff from UNIST. You can see also National Institute of Science and Technology right here on our logo at entrance to our university. Today, I'd like to help young people write their first draft of a manuscript, and you'll be talking with your advisor about everything that's on this video, and you might choose to do some things differently, which is just fine. All right, let's share a screen and get right down to it. I'll get myself out of the way here. And like this. So writing the first draft of a research paper. First of all, I'd really appreciate that you watch the indicated YouTube. It's not very long, it's about 15 minutes long. A fair fraction of it is actually about writing uh, your first manuscript as a draft. And then there's some other things in there that I think you'll enjoy as well. So I do want you to do this right now. So I'm gonna emphasize that by actually getting up and leaving for a moment so that you stop and you go to that YouTube and enjoy watching it. All right. Okay, glad you enjoyed the video. Let's go on to slide two. At least I hope you enjoyed the video. Okay, now, uh, typically a peer-reviewed manuscript that is published about science contains the parts that are indicated here. Each journal can have a slightly different format, but we're pretty used to this format uh, as being followed almost all the time. So we have an abstract, an introduction, results in discussion, that's the heart of the manuscript. Typically a conclusion section might be present. We describe our methods that might also be called experimental methods. And that's a really important part of the manuscript as well, because one of the uh, important aspects of what we do is repeatability and reproducibility. And if we describe our methods very well, then anyone else reasonably skilled in the same sort of science that we're doing should be able to follow our methods and repeat what we did. Then there's an acknowledgement. There's often a section that, uh, that describes contributions by the different authors. Then there's the references. And often these days, there's a table of contents entry, it might be called TOC. That's uh, typically a figure that captures the essence of the science done, or, or at least a significant part of the science done. An important aspect of many uh, manuscripts these days is that we, for many of the journals, can have a supplemental information document. It might be named somewhat differently for the different journals, a supplementary data, something like this. Uh, typically, that is laid out so that on uh, the first or second page, we have an index with a list of what is going to be on all the following pages. So the reader can quickly see what the supplemental information contains. Then we have the contents, figures, tables, etc. And finally, we also have a references section for the supplemental information. Now, I should mention that most journals do not copyright the supplemental information. And, uh, most journals uh, will actually copyright only the manuscript. Now I have had people ask because only by asking do we learn the answers. Is the supplemental information just come some kind of extra document that people just toss in there? The supplemental information should be written as well and as carefully and thoroughly as the manuscript itself. It's a critical part of the entire 
manuscript. And so it's not something to be done poorly or loosely or with the attitude of this is somehow unimportant. Supplemental information should be done as well as the manuscript itself. Now, this may be uh, the typical sections of manuscript and supplemental information. And right now, we have another break. It's going to be two or three hours long. I genuinely want you to stop right now and go to some of the, let's say we're discussing chemistry here, some of your favorite journals and browse through about 10 to 15 articles in uh, these different journals. So I've listed several, but you, you might pick others uh, and look at the different sections closely. Look at the methods, experimental methods, how completely, uh, if the authors have done things properly, that method describes every aspect of what they've done. Same with results in discussion. Are the results clear to you? Can you read their results? Can you look at their figures? Can you grasp? what they did. If you can't, maybe that's not the best written article that got published. I also want you, after doing this, to go and read this one article here. Now, the very interesting thing about this article is it's one page long, and it also won the authors the Nobel Prize. But I think, importantly, it's very well written. Okay, so I'm going to emphasize this by again stepping away. We could imagine it might be for two or four hours. Okay, nice to see all of you again. Let's go on and now that you've done these uh, interesting little chores, how do we actually write the first draft of? A manuscript. Well, we like to do the results in discussion. That's the heart of every manuscript first. And we like to do the figures first because the figures with eventually fully descriptive and well-written captions for each figure basically are the heart of the article. They tell the story and this might include tables. Uh, now, next, after we do the draft of results and discussion, at that point, we're probably talking to our co-authors. No need to go on to the rest of the manuscript. Definitely should be talking to your PI and perhaps other co-authors about just the figures. And then the results and discussion text before you even write the uh, experimental methods, or you can write the methods concurrently if you like. I suggest, as you gain experience, you want to be writing the methods all the time because that's going to help you do your experiments better and you're defining where you got your chemicals from and so on so you don't forget later. Okay, then finally we can write a conclusion. And eventually, write an introduction, but it's very important to write the introduction only about your own work, because this is your first, first author manuscript. Your advisor will help you learn how to place your work in context of the published literature, of your field, uh, and particularly of the published literature literature that's relevant to your work. So please don't write an introduction without the help of your PI and write introducing only the work you have actually done and, and are describing. <clears throat> now we're ready to abstract the results in discussion. An abstract is not an introduction. An abstract is many things that it's not. 
What it is, is an abstraction, abstracting of the results in discussion. It says briefly what we actually did. Then there's the acknowledgement that talks about our funding sources and those that helped us. They do not join in as co-authors. Uh, there's a sort of a standard for what determines authorship, but they helped, they read the paper, they did something that helped. Make friends, don't lose them. Respect the people who helped you. Of course you want to do that. So we acknowledge them. So read some of the acknowledgements in those 10 to 15 articles. Look at those closely, how they describe how people help. Now there may be a section on author contributions. You do your best to write out what you feel everyone else contributed. You're the first author here. <clears throat> You're the primary mover behind this research, but it, it had strong contributions by others. So try to describe what they did if this section is required by the journal. It's very important to use software that properly tracks and numbers the references. I'm not going to tell you what's best. I don't even know myself, but my students and postdocs know the ones who are a little more experienced. And then, you know, you do the table of contents if it's, if it's needed. Supplemental information, contents first, and then index showing what is on each page, be ready to rewrite that, and the supplemental information references. Okay, that's the first draft. It's common and entirely expected that after we write a first draft, we will, of course, begin editing that first draft eventually to make a second draft and so on until and probably it's going to be a surprising amount of additional time for you, we get to the point where we finally have a draft that we're ready to submit. But I bet there's going to be more time based on writing down what we did and learning from what we wrote down that we realize there's some gaps here. There's some parts that we need to do more on. We go back into the lab or if we're doing computational work, back to modeling. And uh, eventually, we get to a final draft. Always proofread by reading all of the text out loud. It's a wonderful way of proofreading that a lot of people don't know about. Our mind can play tricks and jump over things. But when we slow down by reading out loud every single word, we won't have that happen. Finally, I just wanted to mention a few things to really please avoid. How many of us have seen the statement, we carefully measured, we carefully observed, we carefully weighed? Does that mean that everything else that we did and is described in the paper where we don't insert this word was done carelessly? Frankly, when I see that word inserted in one or two spots in a paper, that's what I think. I think there's a pretty good chance that the authors were careless about everything else. Of course, we're careful about everything we do. So we can't be more careful about one thing than other things. Or another example, the authors feel the need to tell the reader what is interesting. It is interesting that, must we do that to our readers? Don't we respect them more? Can't they decide for themselves what's interesting? They can. In fact, if we say that, we're sort of saying maybe everything else is uninteresting. And it also, frankly, I'm not joking either, it insults the experienced reader who says to her or himself, hmm, interesting to you perhaps, but I would rather decide for myself what I find interesting as the reader, okay? So uh, avoid these things and avoid making these as bad habits. For goodness sake, don't fall into the pattern of immediately rationalizing every result. 
our goal is to have a very tight description of the results that were obtained. The poor reader wants to get a picture pretty quickly of what we did. What are the results? And if we're constantly confounding them with additional text, rationalizing what the results are rather than describing them, it's like wading through quicksand trying to understand what did they do, okay? A very tight description of the results is greatly appreciated by the reader. Later in the discussion, we have a chance to speculate. If we are, we better tell the reader we're speculating, can explain further, and so on. Okay, it's been a great pleasure. I hope you found this useful. And I hope this helps you write your first draft of your paper and that you enjoy working with your PI and co-authors on it. Thank you.